Okay, um, hello everyone, my name's Josh. Um, I just finished a master's degree in computational biology at the University of Minnesota, and I'm starting the PhD um, in the fall. As of a few weeks ago, our lab, uh, which is ran by, run by Dr. Rendang Yang, moved to Northwestern University, so I'm kind of both affiliated with um, both at the moment. So I know you're all kind of sick of hearing about alternative splicing, so I'll save you the, uh, the, the spiel about how it's really important, how it um, contributes to protein diversity and all that stuff. I just want to point out that there's a small number of um, canonical alternative splicing events like exon skipping, intron retention, mutually exclusive exons, and alternative splice sites that a lot of the splicing studies we know um, focus on. What I'm going to be talking about today is called exitron splicing. It's a kind of alternative splicing that's not one of these canonical versions. So I want to say something about it real quick. So if you focus on intron retention, an intron retention event is basically an event where the annotated um, canonical transcript has an intron in one of between two exons, and that intron is basically included. It is not spliced out, it's basically spliced in, and you get this you know, bigger exon that's a conglomeration of two smaller exons in the intronic region. An exitron is basically the reverse of a, um, of a, of a, um, uh, retained intron. So basically in the full length transcript, you have a full exon and an exitron is basically a splicing of a region of an exon such that there is a new intron within that exon. So the intron is fully contained within the, within the exon and um, that region is spliced out. So um, in the extron spliced transcript, we calculate PSO and you've heard a bunch of um, terms of PSI. Well, in terms of extrons, you, we call it PSO because the print sends splice out because the exon is spliced, the, the intron is spliced out instead of spliced in, like an intron retention. Um, so extrons are um, sometimes called intron retention loss. There's a few people in the literature who have been calling it that. It's also sometimes called cryptic introns because the splice sites within the exon are, are sometimes called cryptic splice sites. Um, the important thing is that the region, the exitron region has both intronic and exonic potential, and that's why we call it an exitron. It's like an exon-intron mashup. Um, and for our study, what we do is we make sure that the splice sites have no annotated introns. Or sorry, the splice sites are, are sorry, the splice sites do not occur in any annotated transcripts. So they're completely novel, novel, novel splice sites. So when we talk about exitron splicing, we talk about completely novel um, intron, intron events. So exitrons were actually originally des the described in Arabidopsis in 2015. And this is maybe why one of the reasons uh, it hasn't really been taken up by the, you know, the, the human, um, human, the people who study human transcriptomes. Um, uh, they were shown that exitrons were preferentially spliced out during development and environmental changes like heat stress and budding. And something really interesting they found was that in humans, some of these exitrons that they, that they found in this earlier study are basically ancient intronic sequences that have been lost through evolutionary time. And that's why they're, the splice sites are kind of weak splice sites because they used to be very strong splice sites. But then for some other, for some reason, they've been, they've been lost over time. And then in some circumstances, they can be reactivated. So our lab uh, recently published a paper on the pan cancer transcriptum analysis of extron splicing events. And um, they showed that extron splicing events can be novel cancer drivers. I just want to say a few quick takeaways of this study because it's because it's I'm sort of building on this study. One is that extron splicing is significantly enriched in tumor samples. Um, they looked at basically 10,000 uh, TCGA tumor samples and 10,000 GTAC samples, and they compared the extrons that you can detect between the two the two types of two types of samples. They also looked at CPAC data and the, the proteomic data and the mutations. And they showed that extron splicing can inactivate and modulate whole protein domains sort of more efficiently than point mutations. Point mutations can sort of change a single amino acid, but an extron splicing event can splice out a full, um, full protein domain. And they showed, um, okay, well, I don't think I don't, you can't see the cursor, right? No, okay, well. Um, as you can see in the bottom left there, there's, there's the FOXA1 gene, and there's an exitron in the 4K binding domain that if you, um, that if, a, if there's an exitron that's detected in there, it, 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 it no, it's okay, but I, I just can't, um, 
You can't see the pointer when I try to point to this, but it's fine. Um, yeah, so extra splicing generally increases proteome diversity and their potential cancer driver events. So this study has one main limitation, which is that they found um, excitrons in coding regions only. And excitrons can be found in any region in the, in the transcript. So you can find five prime UTR excitrons and three prime UTR excitrons. And it turns out that um, when you look for three prime UTR excitrons instead of just CDS excitrons, oh, there it is. Okay, thanks. Um, you'll find that actually there's, you're, there's more abundant excitrons in the three prime UTR regions than they're in the coding regions. And this is kind of surprising because we only sort of think about alternative splicing events when it affects um, protein coding transcripts or protein, protein coding regions rather. Um, so it's kind of surprising to see that this splicing event is actually, um, is actually more abundant in the three prime UTR. And moreover, the PSO values, the percent splice out values are actually higher in the three prime UTR rather than the CDS regions. So not only is there more three prime UTR excitrons, but in fact, they're spliced at a higher frequency. So to try, try to understand the three prime UTR excitrons, both in cancer and normal tissues, uh, we looked at three prime UTR excitrons across, across all of TCGA, all of GTEx, and some other, other cohorts that I'm not gonna talk about today. But um, when you compare TCGA to GTEx with a aggregate PSO 5%, which means there might be two, there might be two excitron events in one three prime UTR, but if you aggregate all the three, the three prime UTR extron events, um, the aggregate PSO is above 5%. And the number supporting reads is greater than three. That's the filtering cutoffs. And basically we see that 61% um, of the extrons we find in, um, in um, TCGA are three prime UTR extrons. Um, and Basically, the, one of the important things is that we found 12, and there's three prime UTR extrons in 12,000 genes in, across TCGA, but only 6,000 genes in GTEx. So we found more genes that were being spliced in TCGA, three prime UTR extrons. And in general, tumor samples have a higher extron splicing burden, three prime UTR extron, extron splicing burden is about 192 um, compared to about 165 in GTEx. And this is also true if you normalize by the um, Read, read lab read. So we also look at um, dysregulation of splicing. So this shows this dysregulation of, of, of splicing in genes that are dysregulated in at least six of the eight cohorts that we looked at in TCGA. And you can see that some of them are spliced more and some of them are spliced less. Um, you can see that this one is, uh, this, this one is mostly mostly spliced, spliced more, and, and so this one, this gene here is kind of, um, some, some cohort is spliced less, and some cohort is spliced more. Okay, so now I have to ask the question, why should we care about UTR splicing, right? You know, you care about alternative splicing because you can get different gene isoforms. If you get different gene isoforms, you can get different protein products, you get different protein products, and your proteome is much more diverse. So why do we care about UTR splicing? And of course, I know most of you probably know this, but the three prime UTR has a bunch of regulatory elements. Um, uh, three prime UTR has translational control, subcellular localization, stability. There are RNA binding proteins, which, I'm, which we've already heard about. It stabilize the three prime UTR and do a bunch of other, other things to these mRNAs. Also microRNA binding sites. There's also um, secondary structure. So if you think of a, of a, of a region here that's just you know, deleted, you can, you can imagine that that would completely change the regulatory landscape of the three prime UTR. So um, one, one thing I want to mention is, is, is SRSF8. So we've heard a lot about these SR family of splicing factors. Um, yeah, and a, and a bunch of the talks that we've, we've heard so far, there's been, there's been talk about these guys. And we know that they, they auto-regulate themselves by introducing poison exons through alternative splicing. And SRSF8 is actually one that is not talked about that much. Um, it's not included in this paper, and I checked some of the other papers that talk about these auto-regulation events. SRSF8 is not talked about in those either. And one of the main reasons is why is because it doesn't introduce a poison exon, it actually introduces a poison three prime UTR intron, which I'll talk about in a second. And also there's this other, other gene that's kind of interesting. It's, a, it's been recently found to be a, um, 
tumor driver event. And um, we can see in small, uh, non-small cell lung cancer that this um, extra event is, is, is being downregulated. And this may have some effect on its, in the role that it plays in this, in this kind of cancer. Okay, so I'm just going to talk today about NMD because, um, as we'll see, uh, three prime UTR extrons can trigger NMD. I'm going to try to show that in the TCGA data. Um, we also have some data about RNA binding proteins, M6A methylation, a bunch of more stuff, but you know, you can talk to me about that later. So, nonsense me the K pathway. Probably a lot of people know what this pathway is, but let me just say something about it really quickly. Basically, the exon exon um, borders, when they come together after splicing, there's the exon junction complex that gets deposited on these exon exon borders. And under normal transcription uh, translation, the, the ribosome kicks off these um, exon junction complexes. And that once you get a mature mRNA that's been translated, you find that there's no exon junction complexes. However, if you have an exon junction complex downstream of a stop codon, the ribosome is not able to eject that ex exon junction complex, and you get an exon junction complex that stays on the mRNA after translation. And this recruits a bunch of, a bunch of factors that, um, that leads to the degradation of the mRNA. Um, but as you can see at the, at the bottom here, you've got a three prime UTR um, exitron, sort of a schematic version. And you can see that the stop codon, which is not a premature stop codon as, as most um, studies of NMD look at, it's the regular um, endogenous stop codon that's in the normal transcript, but because the exotron is down or the, the exotron is downstream of the stop codon, this can potentially trigger NMD. So to try to understand whether or not our exotrons trigger NMD, we looked at um, three prime UTR exotrons in a publicly available RNA seq data set of SMG6, SMG7, UPF1, and um, double knockdowns, and you can basically just see here that. The, this is the double knockdown, the number of exotrons, three prime UTR exotrons found in, in this, these samples. The double, the double knockdown, oh, no, I lost it. Oh, there it is. The double, the double um, knockdown is the highest number of exotrons and its rescues have a, a lower amount of exotrons, but still more than the single knockdowns. And then the single knockdowns have more than its rescues and all that's more than the control. And the bottom here is CES exotrons, not three prime UTR exotrons. So this, this just shows that three prime UTR exotrons sort of follow the logical trend in the, in the knockdowns as you would expect. Um, you also look at um, PSO values in both control and double knockdown and double knockdown and rescue. And the general trend there is that the PSO values go up in the knockdown and back down in the rescue. And if that's the case, then you should expect that this PSO value is being sensitive to the, to the knockdown, which is the knockdown of the NMD pathway. And you can see on the right, this is the CDS exotron, and the CDS exotrons aren't sensitive in the same way. So this shows in a, in a knock, sort of knockdown model that three prime UTR exotrons are, are generally sensitive to NMD. But we want to know about NMD and TCGA did, and specifically we want to know whether or not the, there's exotron splicing events that are being targeted by NMD in a tumor-specific manner. So how do we identify and quantify NMD targets um, without NMD knockdowns? So I calculate NMD activation in two different ways. So one is NMD efficiency, which is basically the negative log twofold change of the expression of exotron splice genes compared to the median expression of wild type. Um, samples that don't have the extron splice. This is the kind of NMD efficiency calculation that's used in the other papers that try to uh, calculate NMD efficiency. Um, but it's kind of really difficult to identify and quantify NMD targets without NMD pathways. So there's a few reasons. One of them is that relatively infrequent splicing events will be more likely to be detected in highly expressed genes. And this is, this is the problem that actually a lot of us have been, have been dealing with. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a problem in, in, in bulk RNA sequencing, it's a problem in single cell RNA sequencing, it's basically a problem everywhere. But it's particularly a problem here because active NMD degradation of splice transcripts will lower PSO values, right? And so this, this um, exacerbates the, the issue. So we expect that lower expressed genes will be the ones we're looking for for the splicing. The other problem is that 3' UTR exotrons may occur in alternative 3' UTRs and um, degrade specific isoforms. So to, to get around this, the first issue, we do a little statistical modeling, and I'm not going to go through it for a, 
for the uh, sake of time. But basically, we use a beta binomial model to, to, to model extron spliced um, reads. And we calculate this omega value. And it basically is the probability of not observing the excitron. So that 1 minus omega is basically the sensitivity of the detection of the excitron. And so we compare only when we, when we, when we do NMD efficiency, we compare the spliced transcripts to those transcripts where you could have detected, you could have, you could have um, detected the excitron at some kinds of sense, at some sensitivity. And here it's eighty percent. So to get around the second problem, we basically use EPM instead of TPM, where EPM is the exon expression levels instead of the um, gene expression levels. It's kind of hard to calculate exon expression levels for various reasons, but um, if you do it correctly, it kind of work, kind of works out. So. Basically, we calculate NMD, NMD efficiency by, by comparing the EPM of extron splice transcripts to the median expression, median EPM expression of wild type transcripts for which there is enough coverage to find the excitron. Okay. And the other way we calculate it is NMD, um, um, we call it NMD and expression correlation. So here are three different um, plots. The one on the left, has basically no NMD expression correlation. So we're, we're correlating the PSO values at the bottom there to the TPM values of the gene expression. And on the left, there's no correlation. In the middle, there is there is some correlation, and, and this is the androgen receptor gene in the kidney cohort. And then in lastly, in the U, USP13, there's lots of correlation. Right? And so if, if these splicing events are triggering NMD, we would expect that the more you're spliced, the lower the gene expression and that there's sort of like a dose-dependent um, correlation between the two. So here are some of our results. So the, um, we found uh, 1,206 genes, and this is 50% of the ones that we, that we were um, able to um, test. They were found to have PSO correlations with gene expression in at least one cohort. And with NMD efficiency greater than zero and FDR less than 0 0.05, we found 321 genes, which is around 18% 18 per, er, 18 of the genes we were able to test. Um, here's a quick volcano plot that shows um, a lot of the steroid correlations were in the negative here. Um, and on the right is the CDS, CDS extrons that have a less, sort of a less, um, a less uh, visualization of the correlation. These are the CDS NMD targets, the ones that induce a frame shift. So just going back to SRSF8, here are SRSF8 um, correlation plots and across a bunch of different cohorts. And we find that indeed we, we do have this dose dependent re reduction of gene expression um, with PSO change. And if you look at the gen code annotation, there is an annotated intron sort of in, in a fragment of a transcript. This isn't actually a full transcript in gen code. It's kind of like one of the, one of the fragmented, fragmented transcripts. Um, but the extrons that you find in TCJ data is actually much more diverse, in fact, this is the, this is the uh, annotated one right there, the one in the red box. Its splicing frequency is about 29%. And um, you find a bunch of these other, these other introns in the 3 prime UTR that can also trigger NMD. Sure. So um, last thing I want to say is that we found tumor-specific NMD. And tumor-specific NMD is basically just genes that where um, the expression is correlated with PSO in TCJ, but not in GTEx. And the basic idea here is just that we found a bunch of um, NMD, NMD controlled genes, and some of them are, are really important in cancer. Like um, uh, we found some in EGFR, we found some in uh, a bunch of other um, interesting genes. And if you look at the NMD controlled genes, um, there's, there's a bunch of them in a different, uh, many different cohorts. And also, these are the NMD suppressed genes. The NMD suppressed genes are both NMD controlled and they have NMD efficiency greater than one. And these are sort of the best, uh, most reliable targets that we'll be looking for, maybe future functional validations. Okay, so in conclusion, 3 prime UTR extron splicing is widespread in cancer. It affects more than 60% of genes. Our data shows that 3 prime UTR extrons widely activate NMD pathway. And this is in contrast to some other studies that kind of suggested otherwise. Um, over 500 genes show more than show more NMD control specifically in cancer. Um, NMD may play a larger role in gene expression regulation of endogenous transcripts, transcripts, and it's currently appreciated. So not transcripts that 
have an induced premature stop codon. And then around 50% of detected extrons are associated with NMD. Um, but what functional role do three prime UTR extrons play for the other 50%? And that's where you know RNA binding proteins, microRNA evasion, and other stuff come through. So lastly, alternative splicing of three prime UTRs and its role in modulation of regulatory elements needs much further study. And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, my lab, my advisor, Dr. Ndang Ying, and thanks. Thanks. Um, we have time for one quick question. So uh, I would very much agree that there is understudy of three prime UTR splicing and the effects, like you mentioned. Um, and there could be different modules, modulation of regulation. But I would very much distinguish between the three prime UTR splicing, which you call here excitrons, but you know, depends on the definitions of some coding regions. You can just say it's alternative splicing of three prime UTR and excitrons in the coding sequences, uh, which you highlighted from a previous paper. And uh, we, with collaborators, recently published. Uh, a paper that showed that a lot of those excitrons and coding sequence seem to be artifacts due to basically RT stoppage, uh, yeah. jumping yeah. over. Yeah. So you wanna, so I'm just saying uh, everything that you talked about NMD and UTR, this is I think a very interesting direction, but I would make a distinction between, you know, those two classes. Excitrons are very real, but at the same time, the falsitrons are also very real and apparently very abundant. Yeah. So the 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 false trends that you that you talked about in that in that paper, I have a lot to say about that. Maybe we can talk afterwards about about those. Um, but I want to be clear that we we looked at specific kinds of um, 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 specific kinds of extrons that have specific uh, canonical splice sites, right? And um, there's lots of um, we and we mostly focused on extrons that were found in many different cohorts and many different samples. And falsitrons are kind of the random, like reverse transcriptase or, or the PCR artifacts, right? That's sort of less likely to happen across many different samples and across many different cohorts. And, and, and so um, I think we can sort of distinguish between real extrons and falsitrons by having large data sets. Um, but maybe we can talk about that 